You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up... The Rwanda bill is through the Commons. Rishi Sunak has faced down his internal critics. He's diffused a backbench rebellion that wanted the bill to be a great deal tougher. And now the bill heads off to the Lords, where all kinds of mayhem may await it. The week started, of course, on a note of controversy when the UK joined the United States in airstrikes against the Houthi rebels in Yemen to protect shipping in the Red Sea. It prompted a debate about what role Parliament should play when military action is being taken by the government. So we'll be joined by Dr James Strong of Queen Mary University, one of our resident experts, to discuss what role Parliament has when military action is being taken, and perhaps what role should it have. And what is wrong with the whole institution of Parliament? One of the best books about Westminster for many years has been penned by the political commentator Ian Dunt. As luck would have it, Ruth and I found ourselves in a room with him in Oxford, and we got him to talk about his diagnosis of the problems in Parliament and his solutions. Well, Mark, we called it right on Rwanda last week. We said there'd be no amendments to the bill and we said that it would survive third reading, that when the Conservative MPs, the rebels, looked over into the abyss of of voting down their own government's legislation at third reading, they'd decide against it. And that's what they did. So they were just 11 rebels? Just 11 in the end. I mean, some quite big names in there. The former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, Robert Jenrick, the former Immigration Minister, Simon Clark, another former Cabinet Minister. So these were not no-mark backbenchers no one had ever heard of. They were not parliamentary pond life they were you know serious (laughs) players in the conservative party but some of the rhetoric that was floating around Mm. during this was really quite striking i mean someone was quoting a line from one of the batman films about how some people just want to watch the world burn and they weren't talking about the opposition they were talking about their own troops they were talking about the potential rebels and that gives just a flavor of quite how fraught things are in camp conservative at the moment yeah but then on the other side the comments which have attracted a lot of uh, a lot of, of humor and criticism but by Lee Anderson, one of the, the sort of the leading rebels, of course, resigned from his position as deputy chairman of the Conservative Party because he wanted to vote for some of the amendments on the bill, and uh, then got to third reading. Apparently, walked into the voting lobby with the opposition to vote against the government. Was greeted by Labour MPs with ridicule and humour, and, and and they were mocking him. And uh, promptly he walked out and said, I can't do it. You know, (laughs) pretty extraordinary. He must have known that if he was going to vote against his own government and have to walk into the same lobby as the the Labour MPs, there was going to be some ribbing. He decided he couldn't do it. He hadn't got the stomach for it. And, uh, well, frankly, you wouldn't want him in the, uh, the trenches with you. This is one of the problems that you've got when you start rebelling against your own tribe. You know, the, the famous line that was deployed at Hugh Gates School when Hugh Gates School came out against the common market many years ago, his wife is supposed to have said to him when he did his great speech about a thousand years of history in a, <laughs> in a Labour Party conference, Hugh, the wrong people are cheering. It can be a very disconcerting experience when you're getting cheered, even ironically, by the other lot, whoever the other lot happened to be. And that was clearly what happened to Lee Anderson, and he didn't like it at all. But the point about Lee Anderson that people need to hold on to here is he was put into that job as the Conservative who could communicate with Red Wall voters. Rishi Sunak didn't seem to be connecting very well in those seats. Lee Anderson holds one of them, and it was his job to try and speak to that section of the Boris Johnson coalition, if you like. And now the Anderson's out. What signal does that send? The other thing about Anderson, of course, is he Labour used to be his tribe. Yes. Because he used to work for the Labour MP Gloria De Piero back in the day. And now and, he holds the seat. And now he holds the seat. And he, you know, the Labour MPs were apparently saying to, to him, Oh, come on, Lee, are you are you rejoining us? Um, and he felt very uncomfortable. But then of course the other side of it that I mean I am deeply uncomfortable about in, in terms of the role of MPs is he goes out and speaks to his pals at GB News 
He's got a you know very big contract with GB News to present programmes, um, and he goes and gives the news to them about what his voting position is. I mean, it's a deeply uncomfortable situation where a national media channel has got MPs in their pay. The whole business of GB News employing an awful lot of sitting MPs is attracting a little bit of attention at the moment, and people are directing Ofcom, the, the regulator's, attention to it. And I think more may be heard of that, but possibly the other side of the yeah. fourth coming general election, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. So the bill goes to the House of Lords and the the Prime Minister's already held a press conference quick out the gate where he didn't seem to actually have an answer to many questions, but he wanted to get across the message that the House of Lords should not interfere with this bill, not interfere with the will of the people. Unelected peers, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, By uh, definition, peers are unelected, but hey. Yes, and the job of the House of Lords is to revise legislation. That's its its number one purpose, to review and, and make suggestions to the House of Commons about how it could improve things. So it goes to the Lords, and um, then it's a question of how long will the Lords take over it, and um, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to kick it around, give it a good kicking, send it back to the Commons with quite a few amendments? Or It's quite an interesting piece of political calibration, this, for Labour, as a party that is now rather hoping it's going to be in government in the not-too-distant future. I think part of the dynamic that will drive the way this is treated in the Lords is, is, is Labour is going to sort of do as it would be done by. So it's not going to want to set yeah. a precedent for a vis- Eviscerating government bills that might be applied against it in, as I say, the not too distant future. There is talk, there's a, a bit of sabre rattling coming from uh, some peers, not particularly from the Labour Party, but peers like um, Alex Carlyle, the former reviewer of terrorist legislation, a former Liberal MP back in the day, now I think non aligned, talking about this bill ought to be thrown out at second reading, so it should literally be ditched, which is not something that peers normally do to government legislation. There's the convention that's often cited is the Salisbury-Anderson Convention that manifesto bills are never thrown out by the House of Lords at second reading at that first debate. But this is not a manifesto bill, but it is a bill that's very, very important to the government of the day, as we've just been seeing, given the political heat around it in the Commons. The critics of the bill, people like Alex Carlyle, point to the fact that it seeks to muscle in on the role of the courts and declare Rwanda to be a safe country and courts cannot rule otherwise. And so it's the law of the land that Rwanda is safe. And yeah. uh, you know, peers have compared this to declaring all dogs to be cats. You're making a finding of fact in law that way. And they're saying this is not the role of parliament. So that's one of the causes that's being advanced as a reason why this bill should just be thrown out on site as a violation of constitutional principles and proper separation between parliament and the judiciary. Yeah, but uh, I mean, the, the peers like Alex Carlyle, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, who are probably the most the most outspoken on this and sort of one wing of the of, of thinking in the Lords, they're not the centre of gravity in this debate. Mm. Labour is going to be critical, and they will not vote to reject the bill at second reading. I yeah. just I cannot see any scenario in which that that happens. As you say, they're going to be looking at you know the constitutional position. This bill has been passed by the House of Commons, comes to the Lords. The Labour peers are going to give it a hearing and seek to amend it. And from their perspective, as you say, looking ahead to the election, and then they think being in power after that election, they're not going to have a majority in the House of Lords. The Conservative Party is the largest party in the Lords, and Labour would have to appoint an awful lot of peers to get to parity, never mind to become the, the largest party. They don't want to do that either because of the optics, the way that looks. So they're going to have to be relying in terms of the next parliament on the Conservative peers playing ball and recognising mm. the dominance and the preeminence of the Labour position in, in the House of Commons. They certainly don't want to be in a position of rejecting a bill passed by the, the Commons at this point for fear that Conservative peers might do that to them in the next Parliament on a bill that they don't like. And I can almost hear the sort of weary sigh of ennui coming out of the Labour leadership. They'll say, look, look, we're a potential party of government and the Lib Dems and some of the crossbenchers and the Greens can afford to take these big, bold-looking positions, striking poses, because they won't actually have to follow through on it. We, the Labour Party, don't want to set those kind of precedents. And there may be some words about posturing with a few rather rude words attached to them as well coming from that direction. But the key point here is that no one beats the government in the Lords if the Labour Party isn't on board in a vote. Yeah. So what you need to be looking forward to is the stage where the bill comes up to be amended, report stage, 
And what you look out for there is big multi-party signed amendments. Well, there'll be a Labour front bencher and a prominent crossbencher and a Lib Dem, maybe a Green, maybe a Bishop, in a big sort of coalition, signalling that there's very wide support behind some particular proposition. And there are all sorts of ways in which that might happen. I mean, you can see amendments, for example, widening the grounds on which a deportation might be challenged. You can imagine amendments on that point about declaring Rwanda to be safe, to roll that back. And, and a House of Lords committee has been weighing in as well. Yeah, so the other factor that so we've got to take into account is the House of Lords International Agreements Committee, which looks at all treaties that have to be laid before Parliament. It's published a report this week saying that it doesn't think the Rwanda Treaty should be ratified until the panoply of arrangements to underpin this Rwanda deal are in place, and at the moment they're not. Interestingly, one of the things I hadn't realised is that apparently the Rwandan government also has to legislate to put some of these things in place as well. So the House of Lords Committee has said, no, we need to see the evidence on the ground, the, you know, the material changes before we should ratify. It'd be interesting debate about whether the government respects that. I suspect not. But in, in any event, there's going to be a debate in the House of Lords next week on this question. So we'll get a sense of where peers across the, the House, where their thinking is, I think, in that initial debate before the bill gets to them. But certainly my, my expectation is that when this finally gets to its report stage in the House of Lords and there's got to be a second reading and then there's a committee stage of sort of shadow boxing around some of these issues. But when you get to that report stage, you can expect some quite significant changes to be made to the bill before it's thrown back to the Commons and MPs will then have to decide whether to accept or reject those changes. The government, I think, is in repel all borders mode here. So unless there's some technical change that it thinks is necessary, broadly speaking, it's going to veto any changes made in the Lords the bill will bounce back again. How long that process goes on? Interesting question. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. And of course, one advantage for Labour of throwing the bill back to the Commons potentially a couple of times is that it does allow for another act in the Conservative political psychodrama here, just reopen old wounds, rub a bit of salt into them. I, I was very struck by something uh, Rob Hutton, who we had on this podcast a couple of weeks back, wrote at the end of the, the first stage of that debate. He said the Conservative MPs didn't seem to realise they were in an aircraft that had both wings had fallen off, it was about to crash. Individual backbenchers just had to hope, A, they survived the crash, and B, that those of their colleagues who were less fortunate were edible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, well... <laughs> Yes. Well, we'll see what the Lords make of it, the pickings of the Rwanda Bill. Looking ahead beyond this this legislation then, Mark, to, to next week's events, it's, it sounds like a fairly quiet, by comparison, week, I think, in the, in the Commons ahead. But um, first up, they've got the Offshore Petroleum Licensing Bill, which, of course, was supposed to have been dealt with immediately after they came back from recess. Yeah, uh, the second reading was postponed because there were so many post-recess statements yeah. that there wouldn't really have been time to deal with yeah. it. Or, or that was what was said. This was, of course, the bill that occasioned the resignation of Chris Skidmore, the Conservative mm. MP and sort of net zero mm. advisor to the government, who had basically had enough and simply didn't mm. accept that it was necessary to licence more fossil fuel extraction. Yeah. So he's now left Parliament altogether. There'll be a by-election in his seat. But maybe the heat, not the global warming, the heat generated <laughs> by Chris Skidmore was, was sufficient. They didn't really want to have that debate that day, but they're having it next week. And interestingly, they're taking the bill, the detailed consideration of the bill, the committee stage, as committee of the whole House. They're not sending it up to a yeah. committee upstairs. And that seems rather odd because this is a, a relatively technical, actually quite slight bill. It gives the government an obligation to do something it already has the power to do, which is licence more fossil fuel extraction. So it's not exactly a vast piece of legislation. It seems an odd thing to take it on the floor of the whole House because uh, that's normally reserved for things that are of constitutional importance. And I'm not sure that this bill is, frankly, of any importance. <laughs> Well, of course, the, you know, the critics of it have said it's a, it's a smoke and mirrors bill and basically requiring the government to do something that it can already do at the moment, which is produce these annual licences for offshore petroleum drilling. But if you were having a taking a charitable view of the government's position, you could say they're a little bit short of substantive legislation to put on the floor of the House, so it's a, a bit of a time filler. The uncharitable view would be that they'd quite like to basically get some of the statements in the, in the debate about this whole discussion around net zero and the costs of it to the to the public in terms of how we change our economic model and the impact that's going to have on, on household finances, they'd like to get some of that critique on the record with the Labour Party 
that they can use in the election is sort of you know it's seen as a, a bill that's one of the, the dividing lines for the for the government so that's why they want it in the chamber rather than in a committee so that it's in full view of the of the cameras and the media I, I wonder if this is is partly the legacy of the Uxbridge by-election which mm. the Conservatives at one point had expected to lose but which was held because the Conservatives campaigned very effectively against the ultra low emission zone in Greater yep. London the ULES which was pushing up the price of driving for Uxbridge residents now the lesson that seems to have been taken from that is that there are votes to be had from looking at the cost of green commitments that have been rather blithely signed up to by previous governments. And fair enough, there's a campaigning issue there, but I, I'm not completely sure that having a committee of the whole House is, <laughs> is, is, is a way to get a lot of publicity for something most of the time. There will be a vote on it, no doubt, and Conservatives will be able to say Labour voted against this bill. But there are reasoned amendments to deny this bill a second reading, not just from Labour, but also from the SNP, also from the Lib Dems, also from the Green MP, Caroline Lucas, and various other supporters of hers in the Commons. So the dividing lines that exist are, are, are pretty obvious and there for all to see. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. There's going to be a lot of time to fill in uh, in Committee of the Whole House. Um, and uh, that brings us to a, a, an interesting piece of research we published this week about the fact that MPs are speaking more often, but for shorter periods in the House than they have for many years. So there's more interventions, but they are, they are much shorter. Is this, though, just a, a result of the time limiting of speeches that now routinely takes place where the speaker or deputy speaker gets up and announces it i'm I'm now limiting speeches to three minutes and you can see people quickly shredding their speeches (laughs) and trying to try to take a red biro to them and cut down their spiels to something that can fit into the available time that's a big part of it i think but the researchers stephen holden bates and caroline Bhattacharya at uh, at birmingham university they broadened the argument and said it's, it's a little bit more than that it's there's also different types of possible interventions that perhaps didn't exist in the past so you've got Westminster Hall debates there's there's more opportunities there that's the chamber off the main chamber where things like backbench business petitions adjournment debates are, are held but there's also things like ministerial statements urgent questions which provide that opportunity for interventions which are much shorter than you would get in a normal debate so there's a broader issue in place but this vexed question of time limits on speeches i mean it's it's really difficult if you've sat there you've prepared a speech and you you know the lower you get down the order and you suddenly you know you've gone from all you might have started out at seven or eight minutes and then it's suddenly down to three as as the 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 time uh drags on there was a great debate in the house of lords it's this they have a similar challenge there Uh, they had a debate on parliamentary democracy and peers were limited to three minutes. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't give you an awful lot of time to open up your argument. Yeah, well, brevity is preferable to verbosity would partly be my response. And sometimes I think it sharpens up parliamentarians yeah. immensely if they can't just ramble on until they eventually hit a substantive point, which they then attempt to circumnavigate. So I think a system that kind of forces people to think through what they're saying and find a crisp way of saying it is not necessarily an entirely bad thing. I remember years ago covering Leicester City Council. I used to sit through these interminable <laughs> council debates and I once sarcastically suggested to a senior Labour councillor, there were almost all Labour councillors in Leicester at the time, that what they ought to do is amend standing orders so that the press bench could move next business when we got <laughs> bored. Uh, and that doesn't strike me as an entirely bad principle. Sometimes people can ramble on yeah. forever without saying anything substantive. At the same time, Some thoughts are not confinable to a few bullet points and need to be explored a little more distance. How you strike that balance is very difficult. The Commons now, I think, suffers from being routinely kind of guillotined to the point where MPs basically have a chance to make one sort of kind of McNugget point before they're told to sit down and shut up. But of course, what they want is the McNugget point for a lot of them, because you can see a lot of them are effectively trying to get their sort of two minutes so that they can get clippable content for social media. And no sooner have they sat down than their video is out there on (laughs) Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days. And it gives people, I think, a slightly misleading idea of what parliamentary debate is actually like, because often they will present what they said as a triumph, even if it's comprehensively demolished by a, a couple of subsequent speakers. This is something that often struck me about uh, Jeremy Corbyn posts. You know, Jeremy Corbyn eviscerates the government over such and such, and he makes a great sort of attacking comment, but you never find out what anybody else.
else said. So you don't know whether the attack stuck or not. Yeah. And if you just sort of believe in one person and all you want to hear is their voice, that's absolutely fine. But there's usually more to it than that in a parliamentary debate. Yeah. And, and one of the things is, of course, obviously sometimes they're, they're speaking in the debate and there aren't actually that many people in the chamber. And you do sort of lose, I think, we, we, we haven't got, you can't think of many great speeches in recent years which have have you know changed the tone of debate in the in the chamber or you know move people attracted a broader audience outside the house it's hard to swing people with a pre-scripted soundbite yeah yeah and um you know the, as i say the audience often is is actually sitting in their their offices watching it on the tv monitors the nature of parliamentary debate has certainly changed but the thing that really matters in parliamentary debates is whether they're ever going to make any difference. If the dogs in the street know that come hell or high water, more or less whatever's said in the chamber, the vote's going to go in a certain way because the government's got such a big majority, then that rather does let the gas out of any debate. It deflates it completely, doesn't it? Yep. Well, British forces are once again involved in an armed intervention in the Middle East alongside American forces. This time it's to protect shipping in the Red Sea from missile attacks and other attacks by the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Uh, It's an obscure conflict that's been rumbling on forever in the Yemen. And really, the the Western involvement has only come because of a threat to one of the world's major shipping arteries. All the trade that goes up towards the Suez Canal and into Europe would have to be diverted all the way around Africa if the Red Sea was actually closed to shipping. So it's a very important economic reason driving this intervention. But when British forces became involved, one of the big questions that was immediately raised was why Parliament hadn't been asked about it. And with me to explain some of the reasons why that didn't happen is Professor James Strong, Senior Lecturer in British Politics and Foreign Policy at Queen Mary University of London. James, this this was, as I understand it, done under what are called prerogative powers, which are essentially the powers the King used to have that are now exercised by a Prime Minister as head of an elected government, which cover things often like treaty making but also sending in the troops. Absolutely the royal prerogative is what's left when you start off with an absolute monarchy and gradually graft bits of democracy onto it over time and in the case of military deployment powers the ownership of the armed forces stays with the crown but the political decision about how you use it where you send it and so on that by convention is exercised by the prime minister. So what we see in this case is in in legal terms the, the order ultimately comes from the king. But the king doesn't actually get to make the decision. The prime minister makes the decision, and that's what we see in this case. But we have seen precedents in the not-too-distant past for Parliament being asked to authorise military action, notably Tony Blair going to Parliament to seek authorisation for the invasion alongside the Americans of Iraq, but also the abortive attempt to get involved in bombing in Syria in 2013, which the House of Commons actually refused. So why not this time? Well, absolutely. We've seen since 2003 an expectation, potentially a new constitutional convention growing up, that the House of Commons should have the opportunity to veto certain types of military deployment. This begins with the invasion of Iraq in 2003. MPs voted by about 75% margin to approve that invasion. And it continues under Prime Minister David Cameron. We have a vote on military action in Libya in 2011, albeit just after the start of the operation. We have the veto of military action in Syria in August 2013, and we have two votes on military action against Daesh in Iraq and in Syria in 2014 and 2015. And at the time, certainly by 2015, there was a a general belief that a new convention had emerged. It is referred to in the cabinet manual. It's referred to by senior politicians in both the Conservative and Labour parties. And yet, as we've seen this time around, apparently it's not an absolute rule. So what's the distinction here? Are we talking about Parliament's permission is needed if British boots are going on the ground, but not necessarily if British bombs are going to be dropped? The convention, as it originally emerged, always had in it an emergency exception. David Cameron, who was otherwise very willing to consult MPs on military action, he was very clear. In an emergency situation where there was an urgent threat to human life or where there was an urgent threat to the national interest we'd have to act first and come back later and explain why we'd done it. And partly what's going on here is the Prime Minister is arguing that this was an emergency situation, that it was necessary to take urgent action to protect shipping in the region. There wasn't enough time to recall Parliament. There wasn't enough time to have a full debate beforehand. He had no choice. He had to go ahead 
it's part of the problem that we're, we're not actually in charge of this operation. It's an American-led operation, so we're sort of the junior partner to this. The Americans weren't very happy back in, the, in 2013 when we put the issue to Parliament. Parliament voted against it, and the Obama administration then felt that they couldn't go ahead. They felt that they'd been hamstrung by that decision. So it, it's part of the, the sort of the thinking also that the Americans don't want any discussion of this beforehand. They don't want any political constraints on it. One of the biggest strategic arguments against having prior parliamentary votes on military action is that it makes it hard to make credible international commitments. It's hard to make promises to your allies and it's hard to make threats to your enemies if there's always the possibility that Parliament's going to step in and stop something from happening. This is actually one reason why a number of the countries that have a formal War Powers Act that sets out when their Parliament can get involved in these decisions actually have exceptions for things like NATO Article 5 operations or operations in direct support of UN Security Council resolutions. So absolutely, one of the things that's going on in this case is it's a US-led operation. It's usually going to be a US-led operation when the UK is taking military action overseas. And absolutely, there were concerns in 2013 about the UK becoming less reliable as an ally. It's also a question simply about when things happen. It, It is a fact that the UK Prime Minister did not have control over the timing of the operation itself. He didn't have the option of saying, well, it's going to take 48 hours to recall the House of Commons and have a debate, so let's put the operation off until after that's happened. That that was not his call to make. So there certainly is an argument there that that some of the time pressure is coming from this fact. And of course, it's an argument that he can't stand up and make in the House of Commons. The Prime Minister can't stand up and say, well, I have to do what President Biden says. You can't make that (laughs) argument credibly as a UK Prime Minister. But obviously, that's part of what's going on here. One of the things that struck me, though, is that, I mean, the dogs on the street in Westminster knew that Britain was going to be joining a US-led intervention against the Houthis several days before. You only had to pick up a newspaper and there'd be stories about it. And Parliament was sitting. Why couldn't Parliament have been asked when it was sitting? This is a really important question. And actually, this is exactly what happened in 2018 as well. The last time the UK took military action overseas, Prime Minister Theresa May ordered airstrikes against the Assad regime in Syria. And the approach was exactly the same as what Prime Minister Sunak has done this time around. The strikes took place. Parliament was informed after the fact. In fact, some of the lines that the Prime Minister used in the debate on Monday were identical to lines that Prime Minister May used six years ago over Syria. Um, The fact that the US and UK were going to take military action against the Assad regime was widely known in advance of it happening. President Trump was tweeting about it a week beforehand. Nevertheless, the claim that Prime Minister May made to the House of Commons was exactly the same claim that Prime Minister Sunak has made now. We had to act quickly. We didn't have enough time to recall the House of Commons. We couldn't afford to warn the enemy of what we were going to do in advance. So in both cases, the claim's not really true. It's not really true that it was not possible to recall the House of Commons. The truth is it was operationally inconvenient to recall the House of Commons. The truth is after Syria, there is a concern not to be burned again, not to get blocked by the House of Commons. You call a vote, the possibility is always there that you lose a vote. What the opposition will do in such a circumstance is never entirely certain, as indeed David Cameron found in 2013. Mm. Um, why take the risk if you think you don't have to? Looking back at uh, the, the 2013 vote where intervention in Syria was blocked, what struck me there was the, the sheer weirdness of a British Prime Minister going to the House of Commons and saying, it is my judgment that it is necessary that we intervene militarily because of the conduct of the Assad regime in bombing civilians and the atrocities that had taken place and children being gassed and all the other horrors that were going on there. And the House of Commons saying, nope, And then that Prime Minister picking himself up, dusting himself down and carrying on as if he committed a minor social faux pas and and almost ignoring the fact they'd been defeated on a very fundamental decision. It was quite odd how that didn't stick. One of the things I've always found interesting about the 2013 vote is obviously this takes place during the lifetime of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, a period during which the Mm. traditional rules on confidence were Mm. suspended. I would argue losing an explicit vote on military action in the House of Commons, that's that's at least implicitly a confidence vote. Tony Blair in 2003 signalled very clearly that he considered the vote on Iraq to be a vote of confidence, at least in his own role as Prime Minister, if not necessarily in the government as a whole. And before David Cameron, the last Prime Minister who lost an explicit vote on military action was Lord North in 1782. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> although a distant precedent. Yeah. Indeed. And it took a little while, but it did end his premiership. So it's true. It, it, it was a bit of a surprise that he was able to walk away from it. It is partly about the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. It's partly about the weirdness of the decision 
as well. And I think a recognition on all sides that the outcome was not really what anybody had expected or intended. One of the things that's often forgotten about the vote in 2013 is the Prime Minister didn't ask the House of Commons to endorse military action. That was his original plan. That was what was briefed to the media. But when it became clear that the Labour Party was not necessarily ready to vote for military action right away, not without at least one more attempt to get a Security Council resolution at least, the government watered down what it asked for. The actual proposition on the table in 2013 was to endorse the theory of military action, but not actually to do anything until after at least one more parliamentary debate and vote. And part of the issue there is it was a fairly silly proposition. A lot of people didn't believe that this was what the policy was because the House had been recalled at the end of August. And people stood up and said, you've recalled the House of Commons at the end of August to ask us to approve hypothetically having another debate in future about maybe doing military action. Well, well, no, because you, you will then just turn around and use this and you won't follow through with what you've, what you've said. So 2013 was a fiasco all round and particularly embarrassing for the government. But as you say, they were able to get up and walk away from it. And that also tells you something about the personality of the then Prime Minister as well, I think. Who's now our Foreign Secretary. Who is now the Foreign Secretary. <laughs> what did you take from the debate this week when Rishi Sunak made his statement on the, the several days after, after the action? Because one of the issues is, you know, Prime Ministers, to a sense, can get away with this not getting advance agreement from the Commons. If politically they think the opposition's on board, they had Keir Starmer into a, a private briefing. I think the Speaker of the House of Commons was uh, recalled from a from a reception in, in the Commons. I think I Mark, you, you were there, yeah, for the media. He was called over to the Cabinet Office for a private briefing. You know, they politically, they think they can manage it within their, their troops and within the Commons. What did you take from, from Monday's debate in terms of where, where opinion was in the House? Well, the logic of the UK constitution, the political uncodified constitution, is that the government can do things and then see if it gets away with them after the fact. Does the House of Commons punish it for doing certain things? This is what Theresa May did in 2018. This is what Rishi Sunak has done in 2024. And in both cases, it was pretty clear in the debate that had there been a prior vote, the government would have had a comfortable majority. I'm sure having briefed Keir Starmer beforehand and and established that he would support military action of this nature, I'm sure that was reassuring from the Prime Minister's perspective. I've always argued that the thing about these kind of prior votes is there's only really two possibilities. Either there is a majority in support or there isn't. If there is a majority in support, why not call the vote? there's a number of advantages which perhaps we'll get into. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the things about having a vote, as Tony Blair found over Iraq, is that it does immensely strengthen your hand if things get difficult. And Iraq certainly did that. So once you got parliamentary approval, that is a very helpful card to be able to play when the going gets tough, and it might in the Red Sea. This is not going to be, I suspect, a one-off event. It may be that British ships are involved in patrolling the Red Sea for some months, even years to come. It may be that British aircraft are dropping bombs on Houthi targets for some years to come. And it's probably worth adding that the Houthi rebels are backed by the Iranians, it's it's thought. And, and of course, then, you know, the Saudis have spent considerable amount of time and effort in recent years trying to basically bomb the, bomb the Houthis, <laughs> bomb into, the Houthis submission. into submission. And... I haven't been able to. So, yeah, it, it is entirely possible that this, this could become much more difficult. This is always the complaint that comes up in these kind of situations, that what if it escalates? So the major military deployment since 2003 that wasn't subject to a prior parliamentary vote was the extension of the UK's military action in Afghanistan into Helmand province in 2006. There was no vote because it was an ongoing conflict. The troops were already there. But that turned into the UK's most significant military deployment since the Korean War. Unlike Iraq, there was no prior parliamentary scrutiny of that decision. There was no prior vote. So it is a fair criticism. What if it escalates? I think it depends on what the nature of the escalation would be. So in the debate on Monday, Rishi Sunak said this was a one-off limited operation. If we were talking about a sustained campaign, if we were talking about ground troops, of course I would have followed precedent and I would have come to the House of Commons for approval beforehand. And so that aspect of the convention is something that Sunak reiterated and said, yes, absolutely, I would have have gone along with that. But it's also true, one of the things you get when you have a vote like this is you get the ability to say, I have the support of the House of Commons. And in particular, if you get the opposition on board, you also neutralise it as a long-term political issue. 
2005 general election, it was clear that the Iraq war had not played out the way it was supposed to, but the Conservative Party was not in a position to, to make any electoral hay out of it because they were on the record as voting for it. Again, we are, we are in an election year, probably. Uh, Rishi Sunak had the opportunity, facing his first and potentially only use of military force, to get the opposition on the record as supporting it and thereby to neutralise it as a potential future election issue. There's even a strategic advantage because, again, everybody knows it's an election year. The Americans can read opinion polls just as well as we can. And there are advantages in saying to your allies and to your enemies, even a future change of government is not going to change the policy. This is how serious we are. You can wait out until the next general election. Uh, You can expect that that will result in a change of party in power but it won't change the policy because, look, here is Sir Keir Starmer full-throatedly supporting exactly the same policy that we're taking today. So there are there are these advantages from calling a vote, political advantages, strategic advantages. This is a, a, one of those classic bits of the British Constitution that's incredibly fluid and people to some extent make up the rules as they go along. Is there a case for some kind of formalised War Powers Act in the UK. Certainly this is something people were talking about in the backwash of the Iraq war and the Afghanistan intervention. Is it something that could be done or would any government in power actually think it would rather not hobble itself with some formal set of rules that might become inconvenient? I think it's highly significant that the Brown government and the Cameron governments have both promised legislation to enshrine Parliament's role in military deployments in law. The Liberal Democrat MP Richard Ford introduced a private member's bill on Tuesday, a War Powers bill to do exactly that, which had its first reading on Tuesday. It's been tried previously in the House of Lords as well. There's been various inquiries by select committees, most recently by the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in 2018. Lots of countries have codified rules around Parliament's role in military deployments. What that looks like varies widely. There are some countries where the Constitution states clearly that Parliament has no role. Then at the other end of the extreme, you have Germany, where the military belongs to the parliament and the parliament has to approve any overseas deployment of any number of troops for any reason. So 10 soldiers going on a training mission to Latvia, you have to have a vote in the Bundestag. The UK is more towards the executive power end of the spectrum, but it does have this this option of calling votes where there is a strong political reason for doing so. Uh, Well, you've given us the precedence, you've given us the international equivalence. What do you think? I think that you could do it. You could write a War Powers Act that would have enough exceptions for emergencies, for national security, for special forces, intelligence, drones, all of these things that you may not practically be able to bring before Parliament. And where actually most parliamentarians would agree you don't want to prevent the government from being able to do these things. My concern is that if you start codifying one bit of the Constitution without doing the rest of it, you wind up with unintended consequences. This is exactly what happened with the Fixed-Term Parliaments Act. It was perfectly sensible on its own terms. The things it was supposed to apply to directly, no issues, but it had knock-on effects that weren't anticipated at the time. And I think you get into exactly the same situation with the War Powers Act. You open up military action to discussion through the courts, and you make yourself a hostage fortune. You just never know what might come along that wouldn't have been thought of at the time of drafting, that will cause you problems that you didn't anticipate. So yes, it's perfectly possible you could do it. I wouldn't. And I think it comes back to the same thing, which is if the House of Commons really wants to have a vote on military action, it will have a vote on military action. We'll find a way. Yeah. And presumably, has has Labour said anything about its position in, in terms of its next manifesto, or is it just silent on this? Well, Keir Starmer in 2020 committed to a war powers bill just as David Cameron did, just as Gordon Brown did, he has rolled back from this position. And essentially what he said now is that he will follow the convention effectively as it has been followed by Prime Ministers May and Sunak. Major deployments, particularly deployments of ground troops over an extended period of time, would be subject to a prior parliamentary vote, but that would be done at the discretion of the government. And something small, something one-off, something in an emergency situation, something involving special forces that would not necessarily be put in front of the House of Commons. So I would expect the status quo to continue. And uh, I'm not terribly surprised by that, because as I say, this is what happens when people actually get into power and start thinking through what would it actually mean. And again, if you believe that the House of Commons should be consulted, then you can consult it. David Cameron clearly did believe that the House of Commons should be consulted. 
and did consult it. Theresa May and Rishi Sunak are a bit more reluctant, a bit more of a, a traditionally Tory view of the constitution, that the executive should have freedom to act and then explain itself afterwards. Perfectly legitimate theory of the constitution. So again, I don't, I don't actually see what you get by adding an act. And, and I said the same thing to the, the committee in 2018 as well. I, I don't see what it really changes because either you're willing to have a vote or you're not. Either the House really wants to have a vote or it doesn't. Not exactly a shock headline, is it? Government doesn't wish to tie its own hands. James Strong, thanks very much for joining us on the pod. Thank you for having me. If you're enjoying the pod and think like Mark and I do that Parliament matters, why not join the Hansard Society? This year we celebrate our 80th anniversary and throughout the year we'll have a number of special events to mark this important milestone. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, you can join us and follow in the footsteps of our first members, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee. And if you're enjoying the issues that we're talking about on the pod, you'll also be getting our special members-only dispatch box newsletter each week, where we bring together the best news and stories about parliaments here in the UK and around the world. You can join by going to hansardsociety.org.uk slash membership. Now, we're here to talk to Ian Dunt, uh, a shrewd observer of the Westminster scene, a journalist who's been looking at the way Parliament operates, who's developed quite a critique about it, and he's put it in a book called How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't. You can find it in most major bookshops, along with a row of fairly similar books diagnosing the faults of our system of Parliament and government at the moment. Ian, welcome to the pod. You, you've been pretty devastating about the nature and performance of our parliamentary system. Yeah, well, you can see it in the results, which is just shoddy legislation delivered to us by suboptimal personalities and insufficiently scrutinised by a failing parliament. And when you get to the heart of that, what you're really looking at is it's toxic masculinity in constitutional form. And that starts not in parliament, but with the electoral system. So look at how first past the post operates, right? You have one party gets 31% in a constituency, another party gets 30%. And what do we say? You win. You win because you got 1% more. No need for representation for any of the other voters. Just this person wins, which is essentially the way that an eight-year-old child behaves in a playground. Then you transpose that to a massive great big majority in the Commons. And with that, a government goes, well, we won, so we can just do whatever we want now. We don't have to listen to our critics. We don't have to listen to experts. We don't have to listen to skeptics. We don't have to take any of those ideas on board. We will just force our way through. So that attitude, that kind of lack of interest in any criticism or scrutiny of what you do is part of the reason that we get such shoddy outcomes in real life. It's part of the reason that you see A&Es in the state that they are or the transport system in the state that it is. It is poor really right down in its DNA as part of a function of our way of conducting business. You've highlighted two positives in the system, select committees in the House of Lords. Now, particularly on, for example, the House of Lords, that's not necessarily an area that many people look at as a positive, but it, it, is, it is good on the legislative scrutiny side. So can, can you explain why you think that is actually a bit of a beacon in Parliament and why it's therefore not for you the biggest area for, for reform? Yeah, it would be right at the bottom of my list of things to reform. And you can tell that by just looking at the results, right? Like, look, t between 2016 and 2017, we had 2,270 successful amendments in the Lords. And those weren't even by rebels. Most of those, the vast majority, came from the government fixing its own legislation in response to criticisms, a kind of actually listening to critics. So how come this is the one place where that is happening? It's happening because, A, the House of Lords controls its own timetable. Unlike the Commons, which is essentially being suffocated by the executive, which really doesn't exist as an independent legislature, the House of Lords decides how long it is going to look at something in the kind of bone-crunching detail that it likes to do it. And secondly, and this is the really important part, there's no government majority in there. And what happens when there's no government majority? You can't just force your way through. You have to convince people of your position. So what do we see? We see a cultural change in the Lords. One of the things that Lords won't put up with, even when they're a member of a party, is just coming in and shouting out these kind of party political platitude and this nonsense. They will tut, they will moan, they will basically make it very clear that you need to shut up now and come up with a constructive argument. And that is symptomatic of the fact that the culture reflects the institution. You get rid of the government majority, you get rid of the fact that the government controls the timetable, and you start getting some actual quality legislation, some quality lawmakers doing their job. You see a different culture on the select committee corridor in the Commons. Mm. It's more constructive, it's more consensual. What's your thoughts on, on select committees? Again, that, that's the other area you highlight as a positive. 
yeah, so these are the two areas where you see um, effective scrutiny and actually some degree of expertise. And again, it is you build the institution and the culture reflects it. So what do we see from select committees? They're standing committees. They sit there day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. So you develop expertise. It's one of the few areas where MPs actually start to understand the subject matter that they're looking at. We do not have it set by the whips. Actually, MPs decide who sits on those committees. They have a lot of staff. They have outside expertise that comes in to inform them. And really importantly, and this is something that we don't talk about very much, the chair is there to seek consensus. They're not behaving as we get from the speaker in the commons, where they're just an impartial referee, or oh, this guy, this guy, who cares, I'm just here to keep order. They are trying to find consensus in a position. Now you build that kind of institution, and suddenly really interesting things happen. We know from when we've done questionnaires with MPs that those who least like conflict, who most want to work with others, who most seek for compromise, are more likely to be attracted to select committees. And once they're on the select committee, they're more likely to vote against their own whip, to actually start thinking independently for themselves about legislation. So again, with both cases, when you set the incentives right within an institution, you start to get better results. I'm fascinated by this point because a lot of people point to the kind of people who are selected by the parties in the first place. Uh, on a recent edition of this pod, we had Michael Crick, who's been monitoring parliamentary selections by the different parties, talking about the kind of people who are now being chosen. And they're overwhelmingly local champions and sort of board certified loyalists who will do what their party tells them. Now you can put people like that into a parliamentary system, however perfectly designed and beautifully balanced it might seem on paper, but it doesn't work unless they're prepared to stand up to the very institutions that have just selected them. I agree with that entirely. Our selection process basically rewards partisans, because who selects them? Right? And I'm not talking about the election. I'm talking about before the election when you're selecting for who the candidate's going to be for each party. They are chosen by partisans, either in the selection committee within the local party or by the local party members themselves. And they pick people who are basically like them. These are people who want to go out on a rainy Sunday afternoon and deliver leaflets through people's doors. Nothing wrong with that. Someone has to do it. But that is not the best criteria, I think, for deciding on who your legislators are. And yet those are the kind of people that they go for. I asked every MP when I wrote that book, every single one of them, did anyone at any point in the selection process ask you about how you were going to scrutinize legislation, which is, after all, at least 50% of your constitutional role? And not one of them said that they'd been asked the question. However, just because you've got a very poor system for doing this doesn't mean that you won't get some impressive people in there. And I think once you get some impressive people in the parliament, and there are always some impressive people in somewhere around in parliament, even if it usually is a minority, they will gravitate, I think, towards those areas where they can provide most value. And select committees are one of those areas. Have you ever considered running yourself then? No, I wouldn't do that. I, I believe in journalism. I'm, I'm actually quite aghast by this new culture we've developed of journalists going into politics and then from politics back into journalism again. Being a journalist is a really privileged and incredibly important constitutional position and it's not something that you mix up with politics itself. I find it a bit irritating just how quickly that door has begun to, to revolve. I'm trying to imagine here a fantasy selection process if you like in, in which the local party <laughs> committee of whichever party it is is interviewing a candidate and the questions are all about how will you scrutinize <laughs> legislation which select committee do you want to be on uh, i find it pretty hard to imagine that this is going to happen yeah which is why they shouldn't be able to pick these people in the first place just have it for open primaries We've experimented with this before. In fact, when we experimented with it, David Cameron uh, was, was in charge of that experiment. We got really impressive results. We got people like Sarah Williston. Sarah Williston was a Tory MP, very, very impressive, background expertise from her previous career, looked to work cross-party. We didn't get huge numbers of people voting. I think if I remember correctly, it was in the sort of upper 20% of, of the people in the constituency took part in it, but it's a hell of a lot more people than you get in a selection process in the local party, and it fundamentally changes the dynamics. I don't think it would fix everything, but it would vastly improve it from where we are right now. I'm just thinking from the point of view of a party manager, uh, a Conservative <laughs> Party manager might recall that Sarah Williston ended up in the Liberal Democrats, as indeed did <laughs> another graduate of the primary system, Dr Philip Lee. Mm. So maybe for, from the party point of view, you're diluting the ideological purity of your members. I think there's very little that I would propose that the parties would like. You know, the funny thing is, when we talk about Parliament, we spend a lot of time thinking this is, it's about the government versus Parliament. It's about government versus the Commons. The really big dynamic is that it's about 
the government front bench and the opposition front bench against their own back benches. That's where lots of the control is. It's there when you look at the usual channels. It's there when you look at timetabling and the selection of amendments. Over and over again, I think the party system itself has become really quite overpowerful and pernicious in the Commons. So if we look at the polls and if they're in any way right, it looks more likely that Keir Starmer will be Prime Minister after the next election rather than Rishi Sunak. But if, if the argument is that there's a, there's a sort of, sort of almost a conspiracy between the two front benches here to maintain this system, how do we change it? So the incentive structure is wrong. How do we persuade an incoming government to change the way that the, the Commons works? What we find over and over again is that when a new party comes into power, there's about a two-year period where you can push them into reform. So we saw it with the creation of the select committees in 1979. We saw it with reform of the House of Lords from Labour when it got into power, and actually several other reforms under Blair. We saw it from the creation of the Office of Budget Responsibility in 2010 when the coalition got into power, and actually the part implementation of the right committee reforms. So, you know, over and over again, that's your sweet spot, those two years. Why? Because they've had to say all sorts of idealistic things in opposition that you can force them to do before they start to just acclimatise to the extent of executive power that they are handed by the system. That's when you get them. It's all about putting it in a narrative that I think they understand. I think for Labour, that is the fact that, A, this stuff doesn't cost any money, so you may find it very attractive given the restrictions upon you, that when you look at misbehaviour by MPs, when you look at issues of competence, when you look at delivery by government, lots of these issues come down to fundamentally constitutional questions as to how good is the quality of the legislation that you're passing, and do you have the organisational competence to deliver it? So on that basis, I think we can get constitutional reform to a pretty radical extent through um, a Keir Starmer administration. I think those who care about these things should be putting some thought into convincing him on that front. Well, we've had the diagnosis, we've had a bit of the prognosis, but how much of this do you think you're going to get? What do you think would be a good outcome for the next parliament in terms of changing the way that parliament works? For me, the test is the timetable. It's the Commons taking back control of its timetable, which is not hard. You don't have to go back many years, and David Cameron was promising to do that, to set up you know, a business committee that would do it as part of the right committee reforms. They promised it, they promised it, they quietly shuffled it away, and no one thought about it again. Now, that temptation will be there this time. You know, I mean, obviously, I would obviously rather something like electoral reform, but I'm not an idiot, and I can hear Keir Starmer talking, and it's very, very clear that that is just not something that is going to happen. In terms of a package of, of reforms, the most radical that I think we're likely to get in this first two years would be something like that. So that would be my litmus test for something being really quite muscular in the extent of the change that's being proposed. Do I think it's likely? No. Do I think it's possible? Yes. But if the core problem that you've identified is the electoral system, and that's the root of so many of the failings of the House of Commons, if that's not changed, then it's pretty much business as usual, isn't it? No, but everything else is modest in comparison. But it doesn't mean it's pointless. You know, we still do good things even though we can't have the greatest thing. That's what politics is about, and you make progress where you can. The reality about electoral reform, which to me is the most important constitutional change you can make, is that it will not happen until there is a Labour-Liberal-Democrat coalition. And I don't know when that will be. For all I know, that could be in October of this year. I think that's very unlikely. I think it's much more likely that it could be in five years. It could be in ten years. But I think for electoral reformers, it's about sharpening your arguments, thinking about how you do that campaign for when that eventuality takes place, because that really is the precondition of that kind of thing happening. Ian Dunn, thanks very much for joining us on the pod. Thank you. So, Mark, before we go, we had some sad news this week with the announcement of the death of Tony Lloyd, Labour MP, long-serving Member of Parliament, former Minister, left hospital last week. It was pretty clear that um, that he was not going to have much longer to live, and the House got the news that, that he died this week. And there were some incredible statements from members across the House talking about his integrity, his sense of honour, in the sense of he was the sort of moral centre of, of the House of Commons. Um, and I think it's interesting interesting if if you were a parliamentary candidate at the moment thinking about what kind of parliamentary career you might want to have you could do an awful lot worse than model yourself on Tony Lloyd yeah he he was someone who an awful lot of people like it's quite interesting he was at one point Labour's shadow Northern Ireland secretary Mm. and one of the things that happens to a lot of politicians very quickly in that those kind of posts is that that they get a kind of critical mass of loathing because of some position they've taken on Northern Ireland. You all, you, it's almost impossible to say anything about Northern Ireland without upsetting somebody. But Tony Lloyd remained respected and popular with all sides pretty much in Northern Ireland. He didn't seem to 
quite fall into that trap. And he was also, it should be remembered, um, chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party. He got that job in, I think, 2005, when his predecessor, Anne Cluett, another very veteran Labour MP, had fallen out of favour with a lot of her colleagues, as you've seen, as too close to Tony Blair, particularly on the issue of the Iraq War. Tony Lloyd took over and, um, again, conducted himself in a way that meant that he was fairly well respected, even though there was an awful lot of partisan politics between Gordon Brown and, and Tony Blair going on in the background there. He didn't seem to attract the same level of animus as a lot of other players in that did. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. What do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash PM or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Hansard Society.